Uh, well, thank you very much for, for, for having me um, and for letting me come to see Cape Town. It's my first trip here. Um, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. It's gorgeous. I mean, I mean, hands up if you call Cape Town your home. <sighs> Lucky bastards. <laughs> it is. Why are you guys not raving about it? I mean, that's stunning. I mean, um, as Jonathan says, I'm from the UK. Um, I'm from the UK, which has a similar... <laughs> Similar weather conditions. Um, uh, 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 the, the, the BBC has hundreds of developers. We, we do an awful lot of websites and apps. Uh, half of them are based in London, and the other half are based in Manchester. Has everyone heard of Manchester? Yeah. Yes, every, no matter where you go in the world, everyone's heard of Manchester because of Manchester United. It's, uh, the irony being that no one in Manchester supports Manchester United. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone going for Pep Guardiola's uh, Manchester City instead. They're doing better as well at the moment. Uh, uh, but it kind of looms there in the city anyway. In fact, this is the view from, from where I sit. Uh, another lovely day. And um, that you, behind the kind of weird bronze thing in the middle is, is Old Trafford, is Manchester United's ground, uh, which really winds up all the people uh, working in the office who uh, kind of who don't support them. Um, uh, but, you know, you have to look. If you don't want to look that way, you look inside. And one of the cool things about working for a broadcaster is that your offices are a bit like this. Uh, the, the trendy thing is that you kind of put your TV studios right in the middle among everything else, and then you can see all the desks around. So you can, as, as a developer, you can kind of sit in those desks if you want, um, and then occasionally walk the wrong way and go live on air to millions of people, which is quite fun. Um, uh, 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 yeah, and, and, and broadcast uh, scaling is a whole different thing, of course. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't know anything about it, and because... Uh, 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 it's all about kind of the size of your satellite dish, right? Or your, or your aerial. It's a, it's a whole different thing. Um, so we won't go there. Have you been to, anyone been to a, a t television broadcast conference? They're really weird. They, uh, everyone wears suits and talks about, uh, you know, how will this internet fad will go away. It's very, very, very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I'm just going to show you pictures. Is that all right? Just show you some photos from my collection. Um, the, this is um, the BBC newsroom in London. It's quite new, about four or five years old. They're very excited because they built it to be the largest newsroom in the world. And then when they built it, they found somewhere in China there was a bigger one. <laughs> so uh, behold scale comp for the second largest newsroom in the world. <sighs> it's good to be second, eh? Uh, oh, what's this picture? Anyone know who this is? Tim Peake, yes, a British astronaut who spent six months uh, um, on the International Space Station last year. And I got an email from a, another astronaut, uh, Italian, Luca Parmitano, if memory serves, um, who, is, who was Tim Peake's buddy. Apparently, when you're on the space station, you get a, a buddy, a former astronaut buddy, uh, on, the, uh, on the ground to do all your, you know, all your, all your dog work for you, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, take your wife for dinner, whatever, you know. Um, uh, I'm sorry, is, is this office? Has anyone been to the space station? No? They're just not in for the weekend? No? Okay, good. Um, anyway, so this, this, this Italian astronaut uh, emailed to say, Tim is a massive rugby fan. Oh, we're in a country that knows rugby. Awesome. We're a ma uh, ro um, Tim's a massive rugby fan, and uh, he would very much like to have access to the BBC website in space, to, to be able to, to, to watch the video of, of the rugby that we had on. And, uh, 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 and this, would, this caused some technical challenges, and I went over to the team, and, uh, and the team went, oh, I've got a backlog, you know, sprint planning. Uh, but I thought, come on, he's in space. We've got we to do something with this, right? So, so we managed to persuade him to do it. And the biggest problem was that we, um, like, like most people, we use uh, a GOIP to limit where the, the video can go, because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rights restrictions. It didn't mention anything about space, right? You haven't got the rights. Uh, uh, and we went, we rang up the GOAP providers, and none of them had space as one of their IP ranges. There's not even an ISO country code for space. Uh, but, but in the end, we uh, we um, we we realised that NASA has a series of proxies with fixed IPs, so we kind of whitelisted those IPs, and it was all good. And there he is, watching. Uh, watch, that's our website, kind of gone full screen, so you can watch the, the Six Nations this time last year. Uh, scale conf. We've put our stuff in space. That's kind of that's scale, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's very kind. I'm just going to show you pictures. That's my cat. Uh, um, um, oh, cute, eh? Yeah. That that's my team. 
uh, having a meeting. Not so cute, obviously, but much better at talking about scale. The cat not interested at all in scale. Uh, um, but uh, they're, 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 they're a lovely bunch. Um, yeah, uh, that's me yesterday. Everyone found the tree canopy? Yeah, if not found it at lunchtime, very, very nice. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what's next? Oh, this, this is me in Barcelona. Um, any, anyone been to that amazing building? Yeah, a few of you. The Sagrada Familia, an, an extraordinary building. Uh, if you've done a lot of travel around Europe, you'll know the concept of cathedral fatigue. There, there's, in every city, the, the must-see thing is always this beautiful cathedral. They're always beautiful, but you can't, there are millions of the buggers, and you kind of get sick of them. So, uh, um, you know, when, when my friend there uh, uh, dragged me along to see it on our way to an F1 race, we, I was like, oh, God, not another one. But this, the Sagrada Familia, it's utterly stunning. It is unlike any other church you will, you will see, and it is phenomenal. And I even got, a plane, uh, I got on a plane later in the year, last year, to, to go and see it again. It's, it's that impressive. Um, it's a phenomenal piece of architecture. The architect is this chap. Anthony Gaudi, and you know he's, he's done an incredible job. Remember, it's the most visited thing in Spain. Um, he's called God's architect, as the name he's been given. Uh, the Vatican has started the process of making him a saint. So you're kind of talking a pretty good architect here, right? And, and I was thinking, you know, we're, we're architects. We, we might not all have it in our title, but the whole, you know, we are designing architecture things to handle scale, right? That, that's why we're here. So, so if we're architects and he's an architect. I want, is there something we, we can learn from him? And he clearly can do scale. I mean, if I show you, that's, that's the, um, the Sagrada Familia from the other side. And it, it's huge. Um, it's, it can easily seat 10,000 people, plus a choir of 1,000. It, um, it, it, it's unbelievably stunning as well. They're still building it. You can kind of see the crane. But once they're finished, it'll be 170 meters tall. Uh, you probably could have gone higher, but the, 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 the mountains surrounding Barcelona are 174 meters, and he, didn't, he felt that a man-made structure shouldn't be higher than kind of God's object. So that was, that was, that was, that's where we went that far. But you know, it's unbelievable. So, so here's a, an unbelievable architect who's doing some stunning stuff who, who can scale. And I thought, well, maybe there's something we can, we can learn from this, from this chat, right? I mean, clearly not the same. Uh, for one, this stuff takes a lot longer, doesn't it? I mean, um, once it's finished, it's due to be finished in 2026, that will be a 100 years exactly after Gaudi's death. You know, and, um, and Gaudi was 74 when he died. He didn't die a young man. So you know, he, he must have known he wasn't going to see the end of this project. You know, if you're working on a software project that's probably not going to get finished in your lifetime, then <laughs> it's probably worth thinking. So, so it's, not, it's not the same. I get, I get that. So, you know, there's many different things. But there might be some kind of inspiration we can get from it, right? So I did some digging. I went to the museums and that kind of stuff. And, um, well, first of all, you find that Gaudi broke all the rules. I think, oh, that's fun. I've, got, I've definitely got to follow him now, right? And, and we know that thinking different is a good idea in this space, isn't it? You know, that, 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 that it's a great way to kind of to, 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 to break from the crowd. Um, yeah. Now, how did he think different? So, um, has anyone read this book? <laughs> me, me neither. I just saw it on Amazon. But, um, <laughs> look, Googling around, it looks like this book is full of pictures like this, talking about good principles of how you would build large buildings such as cathedrals, which of course is all about the, the, you know, the, the sensible architectural stuff that you would expect anything to have. So let, let's do a really, really naughty one, right? Okay? You've got to get your foundations right, your base, haven't you? You've got to have a nice flat surface and the foundations going into the ground to support your, your, huge, your huge structure. And that's often the hardest bit, isn't it? You have a big, big hole there for years before anything appears. That, that can be the hardest bit. Then you've got to do the obvious structure itself, the walls and the columns and so on, and then you eventually put the roof on it. And the last thing you do, which is the easiest bit, is that beautiful decoration that makes it a stunning cathedral, right? Isn't it? That, that's when you come along with your stained glass windows or, or some beautiful external facade or whatever it is. That's, that's the, but that's the easy bit, right? Isn't it? That, that, that is the, the bit that was obviously, the, you know, uh, creativity is very important there. But from a scale point of view, from a construction point of view, that's the easiest last bit. Right? Uh, and and, and we, can, we can relate to that, right, can't we? Because the fundamentals are still the same. We could use different words. We could use down here is infrastructure. We've got to get our networking. We've got to get your service right. At the end of the day, if you don't have enough service to run your stuff, it doesn't matter what your software does, does it? You just can't run it. Uh, and then you have your services, you know, your, 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 all of your data handling, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever shape that is in. And, uh, and then the final bit, the presentation, which could be 
uh, uh, your web page or your app or you know, whatever it is that you're making. And that's, that's the easiest bit most of the time, right, isn't it? I mean, if you've got UX people in your team, they'll disagree, obviously, because it's their bit. But, it, but, it, but it, in many ways, it's, it's the, it is the easiest bit, isn't it? It's, 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 it's the, the beautiful bit on top. It's like, it's like the beautiful swan hiding away from the madness underneath the water, isn't it? It's, 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 it's the bit. And well, Google search must be the best example of this, right, isn't it? I mean, Google search is phenomenally simple. It's, it's a text box, and you type stuff in, and a load of blue words come back. I mean, that, that, that is it, isn't it? And, it's, and that's its beauty. It's wonderfully simple. And yet we know, underneath the hood, there is a phenomenal amount of work going on to troll the internet and then, and then do all the searches to, to come up with your results, right, isn't it? I mean, did you see that stat from Google that, um, that one search uses as much power as the uh, entire Apollo space mission? Every search. Yeah, that's a lot of space trips we're missing out on, isn't it, by all the searches? Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, or another, another example would be Twitter. I mean, how, how many pages does Twitter have? Two? It's got, like, your, 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 your own kind of personal page of all your tweets, and then it's got your page of all the things you follow coming in as one big kind of feed of tweets, isn't it? It's two pages. It's a, it's a, it's a service so simple that even this man could use it. <laughs> Ah, uh, you always rely on Donald Trump for a laugh, can't you? Um, hello, CIA. Uh, uh, but of course, we know that Twitter, is it was the Twitter, Twitter fire hose is 6,000 tweets a second or something like that, isn't it? it you know, it, it is a, uh, a, you know, a huge amount of tweets. Uh, a huge amount of tweets coming through, and yet you have this wonderfully simple site because, because they have this, this foundation beneath them, their infrastructure and their, and their services. And, and nowadays, we generally commoditize infrastructure, haven't we? We, we you know, the cloud does that, or your CDN or whatever. So that's, that's actually quite, got quite easy for us to do that. But it's why we spend so much time building, uh, building, building all of our, our data handling or whatever, because that's the bit that really needs to scale, if, if, you're, doing, if you're doing something non-trivial, right? Anyway, Gaud, that's great, but Gaudi didn't, didn't do that. Obviously, he did have to get the foundations and the structure in order to build the building, but the he didn't do that first, very unusually for somebody trying to build a building like this. He did this first. This is the eastern facade representing the nativity scene. And um, it, yeah, the, pi the picture doesn't do it justice. It just looks like a, a load of stone there, doesn't it? But it, but it, but it's, it is phenomenal. It's extraordinary, the detail that's gone into this. And he did this first. So there was a period around 1900 when this was standing and nothing else was. So it must have looked very weird. But it was so beautiful that, that the people of Barcelona uh, then supported the project, and they gave money to the project. And Gaudi knew exactly what he was doing. He was, he was building this bit first to get that support and that finance to then go off and make the rest of the church. That, that, that's incredible, isn't it? You're building a cathedral, and he's found a way to be agile. <laughs> that, that, you know, or, or lean, or MVP, or whatever your preferred way of doing it, isn't it? But, but he has found a way to prove that it's a good idea before, you know, the really hard bit of scaling out to handle it. And um, like Mike did yesterday in the first talk, I thought I'd do a series of tips to kind of, what are we gonna get for this? Um, only make what's popular scale. I know that sounds really obvious, but I have been in so many meetings at the BBC and elsewhere where, where, you, where we're sitting around a table going, oh, this new project is going to be phenomenal. People are going to put down Facebook and come to us every day on this little website that teaches you, I don't know, how to sing or something. Right? You, you know, this, this, this thing. And of course, you get so carried away in the moment. Um, so make sure you're proving that what you're making is genuinely popular before you scale. Obvious, but... You know, this is a really hard problem, right? Scaling, that's why we come to these conferences. And what a pity it would be if we put all that effort in and it turned out that nobody used it and it was a waste of time. Um, uh, people know Chartbeat. Uh, Real-time analytics thing, uh, most of the uh, big uh, new sites use it. Uh, they summarized the most engaging sites of last year, and the BBC comes second. Hey, um, so uh, we were the second most, according to this, the second most engaging page on the uh, internet last year, um, uh, beaten by uh, 538, the US Apple thing. And we're kind of a bit annoyed as well because that site was running for weeks. You can kind of see the graph if you look closely behind of all the traffic over the weeks. Was was our kind of live blog? It was a Brexit of Britain throwing away its economy, um, and. Uh, <laughs> 
it, uh, it, it was only alive for a day or two, so uh, we kind of think it's a bit unfair. But, but you know, f phenomenally popular. Yeah, the whole world visiting that page, basically, in order, to, uh, in order to see what on earth was going on. This is what the page looked like. And it had, so I say it was running for a day or two. It was kind of a live blogging thing with some, with some, some video and results and stuff. And it, it had 14 million browsers just to this page. Just to this page in a day or two. Yeah, it was a phenomenally popular thing. And they all sat on it as well. We, we have WebSockets running on this page to update it so we can keep bringing in the latest results or, or, or headlines or whatever. And uh, uh, people, they people sat on this page for hours just watching it, trying to work out what was going on. Um, so a, a phenomenally uh, 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 popular page for us there. Unfortunately, we knew this was going to be pretty big. We didn't actually predict the result correctly, but we, uh, um, we, we knew whatever happened, it was going to be a massive story. So we, we'd scaled up ready for that, but we knew that one. Um, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a general principle, you know, only, only make what's popular scale. And um, everyone know Eugene Kleiner, pioneer of Silicon Valley, invested in Google and uh, Intel and a whole lot of others. And uh, he's dead now, but I presume his family are very, very rich somewhere. And um, um, yeah, he, he, he said a very similar thing. Make sure the dog wants to eat the dog food. No matter how groundbreaking your stuff is, you know, make sure your customers actually want it. Yeah, so that's tip one. Only make what's popular scale. Let's move on. Let's go back to Gaudi, because he's given us some inspiration there. So is there anything else that Gaudi can inspire us with? Well, uh, this. Gaudi uh, was a very unusually for an architect who didn't like drawing things on paper. He only did it when the authorities made him do it. But what he did love doing instead was A, being ad hoc. That's, that's more agile for you. And B, um, uh, he loved making models. This is a force model. He did it for several of his buildings. You can see, uh, you can see one of them actually in the basement underneath the Sagrada Familia. And uh, what's going on here is he's, he's attached loads of bits of string to the ceiling. And then he's got weights at the bottom underneath them. And some of the strings come together. And on the ceiling there is the floor plan. And what this force model does is it effectively creates the structure of, of, of the, the cathedral just upside down. Uh, and then he used a, a photograph or a mirror in order to take the way around. And you kind of have to squint a bit and ignore the, the, uh, 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 the weight bags. But you kind of see there the rough shape of uh, the building? Yep. Um, I mean, how, how clever is that? The, the biggest challenge when you're building uh, large buildings is, of course, gravity, trying to bring everything down again. And here's him using gravity to, uh, to get his model right. He was able to use this to kind of work out the right shapes it should be and to make sure that he's got things in the right place because these, these, these strings were forming the pillars or the walls of the thing and he was using that to make his ideal structure that he knew would withstand uh, the pressures of gravity. He managed to find a way to check his scaling strategy before he built the thing, which you think would be pretty, pretty tough. I mean, even in our world, it's pretty tough, isn't it? To, to actually go, well, how can, we, how can we scale something we haven't built yet? You know, how, how, can we, uh, how can we realistically work out how that thing's going to work at scale uh, early on? But of course, that's really important because um, scaling, again, really, really hard. You need to kind of prove that it's a, it's a good idea before you've invested all those months of development effort to get there. My favorite example of this is auto scaling. Uh, I see it all the time, and I did it myself when I first went to a cloud conference a few years ago. And you come bouncing back with excitement because auto scale, this is brilliant, isn't it? You put a load balancer, and it automatically works out when you need more boxes, and everything's brilliant. And then you realize, no, you've, you've not actually solved your scaling problem, you've just moved it. Because now you have more web servers, but your poor database underneath is on fire because it just can't cope with all, with all, with all this stuff. Um, and the only thing you've really scaled at the end of it is your cloud bill. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very, it's, it's, it's going to be a hard thing to do. I think you have to, a bit like Gaudi did, I think you have to think quite laterally about how you might, you might do this, depending on your project. But uh, ideally, you know, find a way to, 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 to check your scaling strategy. And so, you know, a few obvious ways how. You could prototype, a bit like Gaudi did. You could theorize. Uh, it sounds a bit boring, but sometimes that's the right way. Uh, I've got a diagram here, which is far too complicated, and you won't be able to follow. But... Um, this is a diagram we did for the London 2012 Olympics, so five years ago now, and unsurprisingly for a British broadcaster, the uh, London Olympics was a rather big thing. Uh, we, we, we built a load of new stuff for it. And what we did is over on the right-hand side, this is, these are the numbers. You see these pink boxes? You won't be able to I, I don't, I read them, but these pink boxes are the numbers of people we think would come to um, uh, the different parts of our site. So, for example, 
500,000 concurrently coming to our, our PC website over here and 250 to our mobile site. This was 2012 when mobile numbers were lower and bigger. And, um, uh, and then what we did is we theorized what that impact would have throughout our technology stack until eventually you kind of get to the databases on the other side and we could work out how many queries a second or whatever those databases would be getting in order to sustain that peak load. And, and I put this down to the kind of the single biggest reason why we, we had a, a, a perfect Olympics and we didn't buckle under the load. Because when, when we did this and then we went to talk to the people who were looking after the databases, they had no idea that we were going to get that level. And there were some of these teams, you know, were, were orders of magnitude off in both directions in terms of what they're doing. Uh, so this, this, this really saved our bacon. Uh, uh, so that was theorized, and then load test is, 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 is another one. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that we use WebSockets to help kind of provide updates to, to pages. Um, and uh, what we did with that is we built, we, at the time we made this a few years ago, we couldn't find anyone who offered a load test service for WebSockets. So we built our own, this is the thing here called the simulator. And uh, last year at a conference in London, I, I, uh, I did a demo of this live. I'm not doing it today because I, I didn't know if the internet connection was was good enough. It's actually all right, isn't it, in this room? But it's probably good enough. But, um, but uh, what we did is we did a live letter for about 200,000 people on, on the BBC website just to kind of prove the point, just, just, just for the sake of it. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, a tweet from last year. Uh, uh, BBC load testing, 200,000 users on their production environment. Hashtag somebody pinch me. Uh, so uh, that's the best I can do this year, I'm afraid. But, but you know, this, this stuff, load testing, live environment, whenever we want, prove the point as you adapt. Uh, uh, is uh, it, it, it's one of the ways in which we kind of work, check our scaling as it's going. All right, so that's tip number two. Hello again, Gaudi. Can we have another piece of inspiration? Well, one more, just one more. Um, so Gaudi himself was inspired by nature, uh, which is convenient because we're in a botanical garden, right? Uh, here's a picture from, from what I took yesterday lunchtime. Um, and... Uh, he, in particular, said that there is no finer structure than the trunk of a tree. Uh, um, uh, this, is, this is inside the Sagrada Familia. If you were to go inside and look up, this is up at the ceiling, you would see this. And uh, as you, you, you get the kind of tree thing going on there, you know, each of those pillars is like a tree that splits up, like the trunk of a tree as it splits into its branches. Uh, and then the beautiful light coming through. Again, the picture doesn't do it justice. Go and see it. But the... the, 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 the the beautiful light coming through. It's supposed to be like you're in a forest and all that kind of light streaming through between the leaves. Uh, so Gaudi was clearly a big fan of trees. Uh, and why? I mean, let's list this in basic kind of why a, a tree structure is so impressive. Flexibility is one of them. This isn't from the uh, Botanical Gardens, unfortunately. I couldn't find one. I tried to look at lunchtime. Couldn't find one doing that. It wasn't windy enough. But, but of course, uh, they are incredibly flexible, aren't they? Because the, this tree, presumably, normally, when it's not windy, is there in its optimum position to, to get all the light to its leaves. But now the winds come along, and the trunk is able to bend, and the, uh, uh, the whole branches have come together, and then the leaves. And it's kind of even become flag-shaped in itself, hasn't it? It's optimized to handle that wind coming. It's found a way of, uh, of, of, of being flexible in that. And I thought, well, that's quite a nice uh, of a tip, isn't it? Flexibility allows scaling. Kind of obvious, right? But it's very tempting to go, oh, we need to scale more boxes, more boxes. It's, it, it, there are other ways of, of scaling. If your software can be graceful at the point when it's under the most load, uh, then that is, a, that is an equally great way of doing scaling than just simply adding more kit, right? Uh, let's look at some examples of how you could do that. Graceful failure handling. Yeah, so when something goes wrong, there's always going to be some system that goes pop during times of pressure. Uh, make sure that doesn't bring everything down. We try at the BBC and operate a, um, two steps away from failure uh, rule um, that we should allow any one thing should be able to fail and the system can carry on, you know, maybe slightly hobbling, but should still be able to carry on, including kind of the main database or something. There should always be some kind of backup in place. Two steps away from failure. Uh, varying cache times. We all use caches, right? Um, and uh, so varying your cache times depending on the load automatically is one of the tricks we do to do that. This, this is more than serve stale. You know, the serve stale model of, you know, if you don't get a response in time or a good response, you serve what you had in your cache. It's more than that. This is, this is a, a service going, I'm under load, and uh, I need you to take this response, and then instead of caching it for five seconds, go and cache it for, you know, two minutes or something, because I need you not to come back to me for two minutes, because I can tell that I've got a load of other stuff to do. So that kind of varying those, those cache times is, is an important one for us. Automatic feature switch off is another one. Um, so if, 
you know, on a web page, you'll have your primary content, and then you'll have all the other guff on a page, right? You'll have the, the, the links and the promotions and all that stuff. Um, that stuff can go, right? If, if you're under load, that stuff is not the important stuff. Um, so, so some of our systems understand the difference between the critical and the non-critical elements of the display, and we'll just not make those requests if it hasn't, um, if it's unable to kind of achieve it in time. And of course, auto scaling. I bad moved it a moment ago, but it is it is the best tool. We, we're talking flexibility, right? The elastic, flexible. It's all the same thing, right? That ability to scale in and out is is vital. Uh, uh, a quick look at an architecture we made, um, and again, we won't go through the detail, but those three big blue boxes on the left, they all uh, auto-scale, and as you can see, we've got queues in between them, uh, which makes auto-scaling very easy, because you can just look at the size of the queue and decide if you need to make more uh, boxes or not. And then you can see on the right-hand side, we have loads of uh, data stores. You might be able to look closely and see we, 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 we use uh, Amazon's cloud for this one, and we've got Aurora, EFS, Redis, and S3. We're using pretty much all of Amazon's data storage options there, but they all have their uh, 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 pros and cons, and we're using them all in order to keep full kind of uh, history of what's going on, so that if we have a failure on the left, uh, we will always have something we can fall back to in this system here. Uh, everyone heard this? This one, scale up like a rocket, down like a balloon. Um, yeah, the idea is the, the moment you have even a whiff of extra load being needed, you know, extra traffic or whatever, you scale up. And then once you're up, you take your sweet time to bring it down again, because otherwise you'll be spending the entire day bouncing up and down as your traffic, because traffic is never as beautiful as you want it, right? Um, uh, this seems particularly important if your cloud provider insists on billing you servers by the hour, <coughs> Amazon. <coughs> uh, <laughs> And actually, I did hear this at an Amazon conference, and I did wonder, you know, have they got, yeah, this, this sounds like a way to make more money, doesn't it? So, uh, but but it, does, it does seem to work as a scaling strategy. So that one's from Amazon. This, this one's actually one from us. Um, this, this, is, this is something we've noticed. For every second a page takes to load, 10% of people leave. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if we kind of go back to the principle of why we are doing scaling, it's not just a handle those biggest moments, you know, Black Friday, if it is for, or, you know, for us, it's big election nights or whatever. It, it's, 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 you, it's not just coping with those moments, it's excelling in those moments, right, isn't it? Because that's when you've got your biggest audience, your, 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 the most users using your thing, the most people you want to impress. And if your pages are suddenly gone up by, you know, from two seconds to four seconds because you're all under load, that, you know, 20 odd percent of people will, will, will leave. Uh, so, so you know, it's about kind of excelling in those big, biggest moments rather than just merely surviving. So yeah, that is flexibility uh, allows scaling. Is that all right? All right, we're talking trees now, aren't we? So, so um, what else about trees? I mean, trees clearly come in all different shapes and sizes. And uh, uh, like the trees in the top left, for example, have realized they can get away with a nice thin trunk because they are not going to have the same wind effect as that one we saw earlier because, 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 because they've got protection of the whole forest. Their responsibility is to get as high as possible to go and find some sunlight. So through a combination of evolution of the species over time and merely just agility as it grows and realizes its environment, they have all become uh, different to cope with whatever kind of constraints of the environment they have, right? Uh, do we want to have a debate about evolution? No, let's not go there. Uh, let, let's not go there. But, but what we can say maybe is adapt your scaling strategy as you grow. Just as the tree doesn't know when it starts out what shape it's going to be, so we don't know when we start out on our journey quite what the right strategy is going to be for our scaling either. And, and so often you assume that your traffic is going to come with this particular shape, you know, maybe at these times or people visiting these pages or whatever it is, and it turns out to be not that at all. So continually adapt. As, 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 as you scale, don't assume that the plan you had for strategy on day one is the one that's going to keep you there to the very end. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're doing quite well. Okay, right. Um, I'm going to be really big-headed. I've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be... In fact, I'm not going to be big-headed. I'm going to... I, I invented... This, uh, I'm going to skip over this. this. This is another thing. This, oh, go on, then we'll do this. This is these six boxes of the blue things in the middle. They're all auto-scaling uh, uh, services. And this is the thing that does the web socket system that I mentioned once or twice before. And when we started out, the idea of this, all this does is take data, work out who to send it to and send it to them, right? There's no logic about really uh, what the data is. Uh, but it, we, re we realized in the end we required six different kind of microservices in order to uh, 
uh, in order to achieve this efficiently. Uh, and I you never, you never thought you needed six different systems in order to do this, but this turns out to be the most efficient way of us being able to scale. And so far, this system in two and a half years has done 28.5 billion messages. That's 28.5 billion individual connections between uh, uh, our servers and somebody's uh, app or web page in order to send them you know, a football score or uh, an election result or whatever it is. So uh, we, we kind of got scale working pretty well on that one. Uh, that's number four. Yeah, I'm going to skip over. Uh, I, I was really, I thought the cleverest people make laws, right? So I'm going to make a law. Um, but I'm going to skip over it because we're a bit short on time. And I want to get on to the kind of the uh, meat and veg of the conversation. Microservices. Uh, it's a bit like DevOps. Everyone has a different definition of it. Um, and, it, you know, scale, we're at a scale conference. Uh, is this teaching the, what's the phrase? Um, Preaching to the choir, you know, is, is, you know, is, is he, are we all fully bought in with microservices? Yeah, I mean, um, okay, but, but very, very quickly, we, you scale the relevant bits. Um, that's the beauty of microservices. You haven't got this big monolithic thing, which you just, scaling becomes hard. You only scale the bits that need to scale because you've broken it down into smaller bits. And you uh, scale horizontally because they're now simpler, so you can do that, so you can auto-scale your way out like that. Uh, they're typically communicating directly. They're simpler to understand because they are... Uh, um, because they are clearer in what they do. They have greater reusability because they're simpler in what they do, so you can plug them in in different ways. And uh, uh, I mentioned in the, the blurb about this talk that I was going to talk about Node. Node's a fabulous language. No one quite knows when JavaScript became good, but it did. And, uh, uh, and, and, and it's particularly good because of the asynchronous nature of it, so it's great for the kind of microservices where you're kind of being the, the, the glue between you know, pulling stuff out of the database or, or, or adding stuff to queues or whatever, whatever your system does. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we should make a tip out of it, shouldn't we? Microservices can be great at scalability and flexibility. I couldn't find any way of bringing Garrity into this one. He, there's no concept of microservices in a, in, a, in, a, in a church, it seems, but, but let's bring that as a tip in anyway. But, but one of the problems with microservices is if you go too micro, it gets kind of messy. So if you start having hundreds of the things, then you've got all these things that the comms overhead is, is big because because they're, they're separate things that you're communicating up via a REST API or a queue or whatever. Uh, and then you have the operational overhead because you've got all these boxes doing things. And then you have an infrastructure overhead in maintaining all that as well and working out where things have gone wrong and so on. Um, and even with Docker or whatever, you know, it, it can go a bit mad quite quickly if you've gone kind of too fine grained with your microservices. And then you could invent a word where we could say, okay, but what happens if you did go toward the microservices toward nano services? And these are things that are still, um, still, uh, you know, bigger than a function. They still got a kind of a logical definition as to what they do, um, and a clear, you know, a, a, a really clear understanding of what they're for, but uh, but not as big as a microservice, right? So the, uh, the 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 analogy might be, you know, you had Duplo before, now you have Lego. The flexibility of these nano services should be even more. Um, this page that I showed you earlier, they've got 14 million, whatever it was, uh, uh, users, uh, is part of a very flexible page that can kind of do all our kind of events. So for example, here's a variation of it covering the Olympics last year. Uh, and you can kind of see some, some similarities, but this one's got kind of a medals table over here and uh, you know, different video and, and so on like that. But it's kind of the same, same system as you'd imagine. Um, we built this site this system out of nano services. This is the nano service diagram for that site. There's about 150 of them. Each one of those colored circles is a nano service. Uh, let me zoom in, because you probably can't read them. It's just into a bit of it. Uh, now, I think we need to probably improve our diagram skills a bit, because those lines are impossible to follow, right? But uh, uh, these things, I mean, let's read a few of them out. Top right, that green one, news translations. So we, we offer our news in 35 languages around the world. That nano service is responsible for doing the translation. Uh, what else there? Sport cricket batting table. Ah, oh, cricket, another sport we could talk about, right? Um, cricket. Uh, that's the batting table that's going to show you what's going on if, if, if this page happened to be showing live cricket, the kind of details of that. Do you get the idea, right? And I can't read over there. But each one of these things is an understandable thing that might represent, uh, where's it gone? It might represent one of these things on the page. 
like a medals table, for example. In fact, the medals table probably has a few. It'll have the one doing the presentation, it'll have the one sorting out the data, and maybe there's another one, you know, calculating the data or something from results or something like that. But you, you, can, you can get those points. A, each bit of the page is, uh, is, is a microservice or a collection of microservices, and then it all comes together. And if you've got a good idea, the bottom, there's one yellow one with loads of lines going into it. That's the page itself. So that one's kind of using all the other ones in order to make the page. Uh, yeah, so just to be clear, this is a, uh, how many minutes have I got? Are you holding up time as if I'm, uh, I've got five minutes, haven't I? Four minutes, oh, right, okay. Uh, smaller than a microservice, bigger than a function. Um, still kind of the SOA principles of being this logical uh, black box that you can, you can reason about. Um, they don't run, the key thing is they don't run on their own infrastructure. This isn't something you deploy to their own container or their own uh, uh, s server. Um, they have, we, we put them in an environment that, that lets them run a serverless environment, uh, and uh, they're still sandboxed so that, to make sure they don't go off and misbehave and do different things. And we've got efficient communication between them. They're not all doing REST API between them, because that would be mad at that scale, right? Uh, 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 here's another picture of how it, you have a basic picture. So you've got the page doing components, and those components might call on data, and you build up this tree of nanoservices, all calling other ones in order to make that page. Uh, we actually call them templates, not nanoservices, and this slide is pointing out that they have their own kind of ecosystem. They're all independently developed. They have owners. They have metrics about how they're doing. They're single-click deploys, which means we're into proper continuous delivery territory where we can just change bits of our page at any one point and see what's going on, which is all very, very nice. Uh, and, and how they run very quickly, we have one, well, we have one collection of uh, EC2s, of servers that run this, and we then bring in the relevant templates to run on it. And then we have a very efficient, this is Redis, this kind of store that's able to kind of track all the things that need to happen and all the results that need to happen so that when you make that page, you need that page, of course, to render like all pages in half a second. So you need to be able to run many, many, many of these nano services uh, in, a, in, you know, in a fraction of a second. That's what all this is designed to do. Summarizing at this point then, nano services, if done right, can allow small, flexible, shareable units of logic to run on a serverless environment that can scale fabulously. I've thrown in the logos of the three cloud serverless things, uh, Lambda Functions and Cloud Functions, is it, whatever they're called, from, um, from, from uh, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, we don't use them in this example, because as you saw from that very basic diagram, we've, we've chosen to run it on our own, because then we can get it right. But these things are beginning to mature now, aren't they? They're beginning to come to that point where you can begin to do this. And of course, as soon as it's serverless, you're kind of using other people's kit. These scaling problems go away quite a lot. Um, so the tip for this one, I, I was kind of undeniable about this because it's kind of early days and we're experimenting with this and it's going very well. Uh, but but the, the serverless platforms are just getting there. So kind of like move towards, you know, there's, I think the really interesting thing in terms of scale is that moving towards serverless uh, platforms. And our recommendation is if you make them eat the things you're running, nano services, yeah, slightly bigger than a function. I know they're called functions by Microsoft and Google, but bigger than a function, a... Uh, a, 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 an understandable unit of logic. I think we are, we've proven that works very, very well. Uh, we did about 1,000 runs of these a second during Rio in order to make that page and all the other ones, uh, uh, which is uh, what happens as well. They, were only, uh, they only run if they needed to change. Something like, for example, the medals table only, only, need, only ran when it needed, you know, a new medal came in. So, um, so this, 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 is, this is huge, and it powered loads of our stuff, our uh, various bits of our app, our website, we, this, and then we're now building huge amounts of the BBC website in this vein using these nano services. Uh, and we had over 100 million browsers come to uh, uh, our Rio coverage. It blew away the London ones four years ago by a mile. It tens of millions of people from outside the UK and inside the UK uh, co covering, you know, well, watching our stuff and reading about our stuff on our site. So huge. That's tip number six. That is the last tip. Let's recap. Number one, only make what's popular scale. Uh, what a pity it would be if we put all that effort in and nobody wanted it. Number two, check your scaling strategy before you build it. Because uh, scaling is hard, right? Don't just assume your strategy works and wait till the end to realize it doesn't. Number three, flexibility allows scaling. It's not just about more kit. It's about uh, being graceful under those busy moments. Number four, adapt your scaling strategy as you go. Your uh, strategy is never right on day one. Number five, microservices can be great at scalability and flexibility. That's a well-known thing. Um, but number six, perhaps the most interesting or most controversial, depending on how you look at it, uh, move towards nanoservices on serverless platforms. I think that's really exciting. Um, 
So there we have it. A series of, uh, I call them tips, like Mike did yesterday, instead of rules. Gaudi, of course, chose to break all the rules. We're kind of using him as a, as a, as a thing. So make of them what you will. Um, thank you very much for listening. I really hope uh, you, uh, uh, you know, you, the success in what you do, and that I hope you enjoy it as well. I, I, I think this is fascinating. How lucky we are that the, what we do is so popular that we have to, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, we have this problem of scaling. What an interesting problem it is. It, I think it's such an exciting place we are. I, I hope you feel that too. Uh, I thought to be a bit cheesy, uh, we'd end with one more thing from Gaudi. His most famous uh, qu quote. He, he, he wasn't a man of many words. And as you can see, he kind of dressed like a tramp. Um, he, he, uh, when he died, age 70, 76 or 70 something, um, he got run over by a tram just outside the Sagrada Familia. Poor chap. And because he was dressed like a tramp, people just thought he was asleep in the street. And uh, had, had, he, had, had somebody realized he was injured, he might have got help sooner and survived, poor guy. But um, uh, that's what happened. But one of the things he did say, he, he was a man of few words, but one thing he did say, this quote was very famous, he said, tomorrow we will do beautiful things. How nice is that? Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Uh, you mentioned there were 14 million people parked on the uh, EU referendum site trying to figure out what's going on. Are you expecting to figure out what's going on with Brexit anytime soon? <laughs> uh, question. A question about politics, eh? <laughs> Uh, no idea. No, no idea. Genuinely, nobody has any idea. It was, it was people voted that way uh, out of protest of the government, as a, as a lot of people do at get votes, uh, and no one really had a clue what it meant. So it'll be fun. Uh, your nanoservices slides were really interesting to me, and you mentioned not communicate over rest over them to use something more efficient. I wondered uh, whether you might be able to elaborate a bit more on what you guys are using to communicate between nano services. Yeah, I might have to go back to the slide. That, that, that really naughty picture, where it was. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, so these orange boxes at the bottom are uh, uh, very large Redis machines, uh, looked after by Amazon, the last cache. And, um, so when one of the nano services realizes it needs to talk to another nano service in order to fetch the data, it, it, it will use, the Redis will use as a bit of a, as either a request queue or will use it as a, as a result store. So it might be the thing you're requesting, somebody else wants it a fraction of a second ago and we've got it already, or maybe you need to go and, and, and run it again, in which case it'll go onto this queue and within two milliseconds, the, e, uh, the EC2 or a different EC2 will be running that to nano service in order to provide the response. And it goes back through these Redis boxes. Again, there's about a two millisecond latency we found between EC2s across uh, the AZs in order, to, in order to kind of bring that response back. So it's all done, in this case, it's all done via, via Redis. I guess it doesn't matter whether it's Redis or not. The point is it's internal. They're not separate systems that are communicating via uh, uh, REST or anything else. They are, you know, it's, it really is one system. We've, it really is a way of of, of dynamically including libraries, if you like, you know, a glorified way of, of bringing in different libraries into a single execution, to be honest. Okay. Um, yeah, hi. Hey. Um, yeah, so you want, the one slide was about a about 100 million browsers. The one slide, it was like your last one. Did you... The last slide? Oh, no, sorry, it's close to the end. Go back. Go back. Back. This one? Back. Back. Um, that one? Back. That one. Back. That one. Back one. Back. That one. Back. Okay, it's so one about. That one. <laughs> yeah, I never had coffee yet. Um, but one. yeah, it's so the one about uh, 100 million browsers you have to support. I guess it's not going to talk, but how do you scale the testing and like, all the, the, the UI for like 100 million different browsers? Or I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, str I'm struggling to hear you. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, it's about. Uh, yeah, maybe I need coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how, do you, how do you scale testing of the UI? How do you scale testing of the UI? Um, so, a specific testing of the UI. So, uh, 
I mean, for load tests, we, we will run load tests where we have a lot of headless browsers that will, that will simulate very large numbers of, 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 of browsers, which um, including, you know, all, the, all of the, the any dynamic updates and so on to it. And then we'll have people monitoring that as well to make sure that the pages still look as they do under load. We haven't suddenly, uh, you know, made everything look horrible or whatever. Come to the front. Hi, Mike. Hey. Um, so my question would be, you're talking about uh, nano services and yep. each service is responsible for sourcing its own data uh, and rendering it and serving it back to the page. Do you have a service that looks at collating data or sourcing requests? Uh, so, you know, if you have a, an application running in the browser and you're doing WebSocket connections, but you've got multiple components running, do you aggregate that that type of data sourcing in, at a at a higher level, or is each re each component responsible for requesting and updating its individual segment? Yeah, good question. So we have one WebSocket open which can do all the kind of data. So yeah, so on a, oh, let's pick a page, you know, something, something like that. So that that that. Uh, that page, there's lots of different things there that could be requesting data, the medals table or the, or the headlines or whatever, all those different bits. And yeah, so it's one WebSocket. They're all individually saying, I'm interested in this data. And then there's kind of one server that's providing that WebSocket will go off and talk to the relevant nano services. So it will go, right, medals table nano service, let me know when you know, there's been a medal. And then that can be an event-driven thing coming back through the stack or, or, or whatever. Hi, I've got a question about the nano services. Would something like AWS Lambdas be a, an example of a, a nano service or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was. I think I was a bit rushed at the end. That's what I was trying to kind of uh, should have done a better job of getting across. I, I think, yes, I think they're a little bit immature. I think when you start building very large, like that tree I had of 150 of them or so. Uh, from, we haven't gone that far to town with them. I don't think they're quite ready for that level yet. There's, a, there's limits around it, but I think that's where we're getting to. Yeah, that, that cloud's raising that level of abstraction. So you, you may, is there a future when we have no virtualized machines at all? We just have these lumps of code we're giving to the cloud and say, just run them at the right time, will you? I, that, I think that, that's the kind of nano service dream. Yeah. Hey. Um, I saw on the nano service screen you had something that looked like semantic version numbers on them. How do you manage your dependencies and know which service can actually talk to which ones? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, we use full semantic versioning. We, we treat them a bit like any other JavaScript node library. So they have the NPM package JSON that can have all their dependencies in there. So you're right, you, you have all these different versions. At any one point, you might get two different versions of the same nano service running because their clients are demanding different versions. Uh, so that's kind of where it is more like a library than it is like a, uh, you know, a separate service in that regard. Excellent. Awesome. Cool. Thank you very much. Let's thank Matthew. Thank you.